to Circle to Sphere, the origins of the Laser Light Show. My name is Sonia Epstein. I'm the executive editor and associate curator of science and film here at the museum. Um, this program is part of a series that I curate called Science on Screen, which explores everything from seahorses to robots to dust to lasers. Uh, bringing scientists and filmmakers to the museum for wide-ranging discussions that offer new perspectives on both film and scientific subject matter. Science on Screen is a nationwide initiative of the Coolidge Corner of Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. So a quick background about all the films that we'll be showing tonight. They're all connected in some way to the origins of the popular laser light show that began at the Griffith Observatory in 1973 and became the longest running theatrical attraction in Los Angeles. Light shows have historically been presented in non-traditional theatrical spaces and have brought the public into scientific spaces, namely planetariums, often integrating uh, images of space uh, or other sort of scientific images itself. I was turned on to the laser light show, so to speak, by researching the largely overlooked contribution to the light show made by physicist Elsa Garmeyer, who I am really thrilled to say is here with us tonight. Garmeyer was completing her postdoctorate at Caltech in the late 60s and early 70s when she started collaborating with the legendary organization Experiments in Art and Technology co-founded by artist Robert Rauschenberg and computer engineer Billy Cooper. She began experimenting with lasers to make art images. As she is quoted in the Caltech newspaper as saying in 1971, if I do science, I do it here. If I do art, I do it here at night. <laughs> <laughs> Two filmmakers, Ivan Dyer and Dale Pelton, saw Garmar's laser images and were inspired to film them, resulting in Laser Image, a 1972 proof of concept short film that they used to pitch the Griffith Observatory to create a full-scale laser light show, what became Laserium, otherwise known as House of Laser. So tonight, we'll be seeing a newly restored 16 millimeter print of this proof of concept film, which really hasn't ever been seen. Before that, we'll be seeing one of the earliest animations by a German filmmaker named Walter Rutman. Then we'll see a silent film of one of Thomas Wilfred's kinetic sculptures called The Cladlocks that he constructed in 1930 filmed by collector A.J. Epstein, in relation, but a great person, who is also here. Uh, Wilfred was a Danish sculptor and musician whose work was on permanent display in MoMA for close to 17 years, beginning in 1964, influencing a generation of filmmakers and light artists, including Jordan Belson and Joshua White, whose work we will also see. Belson was a sem seminal figure in avant-garde cinema. He created the first abstract visual performance to bring audiences into a planetarium, a precursor to the Griffiths Laser Light Show. Belson's Vortex series at San Francisco's Morrison Planetarium ran over two years, produced over 60 shows, and used multiple projectors and dozens of speakers for a uh, unfilmable um, but truly immersive experience. Belson, while notoriously reclusive, was also a great collaborator and worked frequently with Stephen Beck, a light sculptor, computer engineer, and electronic musician who invented one of the first video synthesizers in 1969 that was used to create visuals for the film Cycles that we'll also be seeing. I know this is a lot, and it is a program that lists all of these things. <laughs> anyway, the majority of the works presented tonight need to be seen in person, and there are a limited number in circulation, so they are often, uh, I would say, not as widely known as their influence on both other artists and popular culture might suggest. So this will be an hour-long film program. It'll run chronologically, and it will be followed by a very special laser demonstration, a live one, and then a conversation. So as mentioned, we are very lucky to have with us Elsa Garmeyer. Dr. Garmeyer is the Sydney Junkins Professor of Engineering uh, Emeretta and former Thayer School of Engineering Dean at Dartmouth. She's also the former president of the Optical Society. I'm also super excited that Joshua White is here with us as well. White is the founder of the infamous Joshua Light Show, which was a resident of the Fillmore East from 1968 to 71 and performed live improvisational visual mixes behind musicians including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and the band, among you know, dozens of others. I'm so pleased that AJ Epstein is also here. Epstein, in addition to being the artist and producer, is a vital collector with his uncle Eugene of Thomas Wilfred's work. Eugene is an astronomer who fell in love with Wilfred's sculptures when he first saw them in the late 50s. 
He and Wilfer maintained a correspondence that began in 1960 and continued until Wilfer's death in 1968. Before we begin, I just want to thank Raymond Foy, who's in the audience, uh, and who, you know, basically without whom we wouldn't have the pleasure and privilege of seeing Nelson's films tonight. Raymond is a writer and curator who organized the Jordan Nelson Painting Show that I recommend all of you see that's currently at Matthew Marks Gallery. And I also want to thank Julie Martin, who's here, who is an artist who was integrally involved in experiments in art and technology and who helped me first connect with Elsa. So I'm going to say that let's begin the screening. And I encourage all of you to stick around afterwards for the laser show uh, and the conversation. Uh, so I will see you then. Great. I'm Elsa Dromeyer. I thought I'd show my. I thought I'd show my technical abilities by putting these lasers up, but I guess I have to show you my management abilities because they did it while I was out. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the story, and. Uh, I thought I'd begin with how did I get interested in this. You heard that I was a, a graduate student in, or a postdoc in lasers. I actually was lucky enough to be at MIT doing my PhD research in physics and worked with Charles Towns, who was the person who ultimately won the Nobel Prize for having developed the ideas behind the laser. And my PhD was the second in the field of lasers. So I was really there at the very beginning. And I went to Caltech as a postdoc. By the way, at the time, there were no women faculty or women students, but they took women postdocs for a very small salary. And actually, I got a little bored with my work and had a little extra time. and. The, I got involved in this organization, Experiments in Art and Technology. That was a group of people who worked to bring together artists and scientists, or artists and engineers working together. And through my boss, uh, who was formerly from Bell Labs, I got to know Billy Kluver, who was formerly from Bell Labs. They had been friends. And I was introduced to Billy, and it was suggested that I was interested in all kinds of wild things, and maybe I would get involved in art. So I got involved in the Tetsukoa Pavilion that was put up in Japan. And my responsibility was designing the optics for the large dome that was uh, brought in that made a real image, because my field was optics and lasers. In that show was a laser light show that I was not particularly impressed by. And so I started playing around with lasers. And I thought, well, I can be an artist too. And what is it about lasers that, that make it an artistic medium? Well, there was a lot of good work going on in holography, some very interesting art. And if you haven't been to the Holography Museum, you should go. Um, but that was a bit over my head uh, in time, etc. And I decided what I really liked about lasers is that they were pretty. <laughs> and you see, I still think they're pretty 50 years later. And, and uh, so I thought, OK, I will work with that, and I will make laser images. And my original laser images were photographs that I made in color, nice living color. But in those days, photography wasn't a popular field. And so it was really looked down upon as, as an artistic field. Well, I found out about a woman who was opening a new gallery in photography uh, on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. And I went to the gallery, and I said, when I looked at what she had there, it was you know, women and, and poodle dogs or something. And I said, you really need to have my laser images here. I mean, that would bring people out. <laughs> so I was a good talker, and she said, all right. So she gave me the front room of the gallery, and I brought my stills. If you look at these every once in a while, it gets really pretty. So I took a bunch of stills. At the same time, I had built what we're showing here, which is nothing more than a rotating 
uh, piece of glass or plastic with a pattern on it that will make these kinds of images. And I had built a, a, a home-sized one with two different uh, ro rotational uh, Motors. <laughs> that one has three and three colors. It, it, 50 years ago, there was only one laser anybody could afford, and that was a red laser. And so this one was the red was with the red laser, and uh, I, I put it in a nice, beautiful black plastic box. And I thought I would sell these. I was going to sell them for $600 a piece. I think the laser cost 300 or something. Anyway. Uh, the important point is I got the press to come. And the television people came, and I was on television, all very exciting news. Uh, nothing happened. Nobody bought anything, <laughs> <laughs> except uh, the show was seen by a couple of filmmakers at UCLA who were trying to write their master's film, to do a master's film. And they decided they would contact me, which they did. And Ivan Dreyer and Dale Pelton came over. And at night, we used our uh, blue laser. We had a great big one that cost $15,000. In those days, $15,000 was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I could do that blue that you saw in the film. The film you saw was basically many of those images that I created with uh, using the blue argon laser and the red UV and neon laser, and then um, uh, various pieces of glass and plastic that we put in front of it to get all these motions. And there was a lot of really nice film work done by Ivan Dreyer to turn it into that incredibly impressive film. Uh, so, um, that was it. We formed, well, Ivan Dreyer had connections with the planetarium. He was working there as a technician. And we actually took our big argon laser down to the planetarium to demonstrate it, uh, which I'm not sure my boss knew about at the time. <laughs> and anyway, at the time that it was ready to go, we formed a company called Laser Images Incorporated. Um, and then it turns out I was leaving to go on a year's sabbatical around the world with my husband and two children. And I just decided I would give this all up. And I gave it off to Ivan, who did a tremendous job for many, many years. I was off deciding that I could either be an artist or a scientist. And I decided that. I made more money as a scientist as an artist. And I, you may or may not know that 50 years ago, the only women that ever made any money at all as artists were married to famous men artists. And there was just no role for a random woman, except for Judy Chicago, I guess, who ended up being very successful. Uh, so that's the story. What have I got here? I've got. And the reason why we can do it now is that you can buy lasers. This laser here is one of these things that's called a burning laser. And let me tell you, if you want to go into the laser light show business, do not let anybody under 21 try to buy one of these burning lasers. They will blind you. And there are stories on the web of people who literally lost their sight with this laser. It's very easy to do. Uh, so be very careful. This is a, uh, I think it's 10 watt. I've forgotten exactly how much it is. But it's only something like $200. It's amazing how, how cheap it is to blind your eyes. You <laughs> 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 are over there. Each of those are $10 a piece. They're up to 30 milliwatts. The legal limit is 5 milliwatts. So these are already a factor of six over the legal limit. <laughs> and if you put them like this, they will blind you. Five milliwatts will not, but these will. So again, 
if you have a kid or you want to have one of these lasers to chase your cat around, <laughs> don't buy more than five little ones. <laughs> That's my statement of laser safety. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to give my job for a and they'll join us on stage and we'll talk for like 20 minutes. <laughs> And um, then we'll we'll have time for some questions, and we'll we'll wrap up soon. But we hope you can stay. Okay, AJ and Joshua, come on up. I guess I should finish my story with I did go on to work in the in the field of lasers, and became relatively well known. Got to be in the Ma National Academy of Engineering, which is the highest thing. Uh, when I was elected, out of two thousand members, there were fifteen women. Yeah. Now there are 30 or 40. And yes, I made a lot more money than I would have just an artist. <laughs> yeah, there you are, man. Right, so. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start by just the general question to all of you that um, if any of you have any reactions that you would like to share after. Uh, seeing Allison's demonstration, but also the you know entire film program and uh, kind of the history or just any thoughts, or else I can go on to more specific questions. <laughs> I, I guess that's me. Uh, the, uh, I've, been, I've never seen the Joshua Light Show projected like that. I've only seen it doing it with other people uh, or looking at it on a monitor or on a smaller screen. So um, it. it I think we got through that 13 minutes because the music was amazing. The music drove it. And, uh, and that was just one of many different things, but it, it was amazing to see how bright it was. And I regret that the other wonderful artists that we saw represented here it couldn't work through digital. It just didn't exist then. So part of what makes this work, what made it work, is just how amazing modern technology has gotten. And I wish that the case for the other ones. I'm just kind of blown away by the whole program. Um, I was having, you know, 50 reactions a second to everything. I, I kind of don't know where to start. Um, but I'll, no, I'll, I'll say one thing, that the, the first film that we saw, the German film, um, the very start of it with that sort of um, growing oval really reminded me, there's there's a photograph, I have no idea how they did it, but there's a photograph from the Trinity tests that measured, that got the, the, the ignition of the bomb within microseconds of the ignition, not milliseconds, microseconds, and so you see this otherworldly sort of sphere uh, that's got tendrils and stuff in it, and it's the most bizarre thing, and it's, it's not of this earth, and the, the, that film reminded me of that, and that's just seared into my mind right now, but Everything else is beautiful. <laughs> uh, one of the things I was going to point out is the challenge is to stop and imagine how would you do it without computers and without digital stuff. It, I watched some of those and I just couldn't imagine how they were done. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do know one of them had liquids going between, immiscible liquids uh, going through themselves and, you know, mirrors and things. What I always like, and one of the ways I like to describe Wilfred's work is um, mirrors, comma, no smoke. <laughs> uh, and so I just challenge you all to, to think about that and, and imagine that you didn't have all the, the cheap cheating stuff that you do. I still think there's a lot that can be done. I should say also that I had a chance to see at, at a very high level a, the very best digital and the very best analog film. And you can really tell the difference. And there's many times when the film gives you a better character for what you want than digital. Okay, so um, AJ, to go back historically a little bit, uh, Lumia, for those of you who don't know, was Thomas Wilford's term for art created by light. Um, this was, you know, he first developed the Clavelux and, and Lumia in the 1910s and first exhibited them in 1921. And um, he wrote that his performances were capable of showing continual metamorphoses of color. So I'm curious if uh, you could explain a little bit how you came to understand what that term means and what he meant by it and how it continues or not today. 
Uh, well, I can talk for about six hours. <laughs> um, you know, one of the most interesting things is Wilfred felt that he wasn't the inventor of light art. He was the discoverer of a new art form, and he thought of himself as an inventor of the device, the clavulus, which allowed you to compose and perform on it. And Wilfred said several times in his correspondence with friends, um, sometimes he used Beethoven, sometimes he used Mozart, but he said, you know, I am not the greatest, to the effect of, I am not the greatest Lumina artist, you know, or the Beethoven or the Mozart of it. You know, they might not have even been born yet. So he very much wanted the art form to encompass an entire movement of art. And he referred to Lumina as the eighth art, um, a silent art. And uh, really his life's thesis, in my opinion, was now that we have the electric motor and the electric light bulb, we can control light with such dexterity and subtlety that, um, that we can compose with it and it can stand alone as an art form. And I think he proved it very well. Um, ironically, though, um, he was never really the high piper for this art form that he wanted to be. Um, and I could talk for hours about, about that, what I, why I think that happened or didn't happen. But, um, you know, what we, his term for Lumia was specifically meant to encompass all light art. That was his vision. But where we are now is Lumia very, is, is a very well established and beloved segment of the light art world. And um, so Lumia refers to Wilfred's vocabulary. Um, I would suggest that if somebody wanted to <coughs> improve on it, I, I think there there are directions to go. I mean, I, I'm in love with laser <laughs> vocabulary, but laser vocabulary is a very sharp, scintillating kind of thing. And th there are now LEDs, for example, all sorts of color that can be controlled, and you could do things in a more subtle way the way he did. And I think Lumia has a, a very large possibility. I was turned on, when I got turned on to the, these image, moving images, uh, I was turned on to the idea of a light organ, where you, you have an organ that is both playing music and also playing your instrument, and you could put them together. And of course, now with controllers of all sorts, that's a straightforward thing to do. And I do think there's a lot of opportunity if people want to be creative. I don't know of anybody that's really doing um, very high quality work in that area. They're trying. I, I, I'm serious. Yeah. I'm seeing people try. Uh, just uh, because it, everything is accessible now doesn't mean that, they, that people are making great art automatically, just like anything else. But I'm seeing improvement. I'm seeing people begin to really understand that the light is part of the palette, and you build you build from that. The light itself, the laser light itself, is not the art. It's what you do next, and how you use it with other things. I can give a, a little bit of a, a personal history because I was I was deeply involved in doing psychedelic light shows. I had first seen a laser as a, a, a senior at USC. Uh, it was just in the scientific department they were displaying a ruby laser, and I, as a very young person, went and looked at it and said, "God, that is just one beautiful light." And what made it beautiful was that it was coherent. It was the strengthening of light that was not not doing anything else. And I was a cinematography major, so I was very wrapped up in it. I just sort of put it away in my mind. Um, I was doing a light show, and light show was what you saw here, plus many more things, all done with people standing behind the screen, uh, waving mirrors around, doing liquids and things, and basically uh, channeling uh, other artists, in, including Thomas Wilford, who was very important. Uh, I went out to California in 1969, and I saw uh, a laser for the first time that could be used in a performance. And I just wanted to take a moment to tell you that at that moment, uh, technology was not readily available. So the guys that had come up with a red thing that made residue patterns, basically, just residue patterns, uh, were uh, essentially uh, uh, scientific science majors and, and physicists. And they thought that they had you know, really found the holy grail. And I wanted to buy one. I wanted to mix it in with the light show, and they really did, didn't. They didn't really want to sell it to me, so they didn't. 
And the same thing happened, I wanted to tell you, with strobe lights. The first strobe lights, the ones we're so used to now, were really made by, 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 by electronics people and by students, MIT. Uh, and they were the first ones to make the Wikipedia strobe light that everybody craved. And you couldn't buy it. Um, it didn't really come on the market, even in original handmade version, until later. But the part, the part I wanted to tell you was, I had, by the time Lazarian came along, I had, uh, I was out of school and I had, had moved on from light shows. And light shows is a great way not to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I went on uh, and just became a television director, never losing my interest. But I was very frustrated by Lazarian. And the reason I was frustrated was because, God damn it, he did it. He physically monetized something which I couldn't get my hands on. And when it was available, uh, I wasn't doing it anymore. And they found the perfect place, which was this underused space uh, of planetarium. They were underused and dry as toast. If you ever saw an old planetarium show, they may have been wonderful, but they were dry. <laughs> and, um, and I was just. You have to be a scientist. You have to be a scientist, exactly. Yeah. That's who was controlling them. So the very fact that he was able to get in in the first place was amazing. Pretty soon, everybody had some kind of laser show going on, but this one was really good. And as it evolved, the people running it, had, who were uh, called themselves laserists, were, uh, had to be a musician and an engineer. Uh, they had to do it all, and they would run these controls and improvise these light shows. I didn't like them. And the reason I didn't like them is because I thought that once you saw what you could do and you could back, reverse engineer, so there was a little piece of glass they were moving around. Um, I began to be frustrated because they were using wonderful music, Laser Floyd, Grateful Dead Floyd, uh, but they didn't mix it with any concrete imagery. And when they started to do that, they insisted on drawing pictures with lasers. Well, drawing pictures with lasers looks like neon uh, connected dots. And, uh, and, and I just was always hopeful that, that one day, if you're doing a song about a magical horse, See a horse for a moment. Use a slide projector. It's not going to. It's not going to ruin anything. But that was my big objection: was the the perfection that they saw, and they wouldn't loosen up. And the work I wanted to do, and now have returned to, I retired from television, is you mix it all up. And um, and the only thing that I haven't put back into the show um, is lasers. And there's no reason, particularly, why not. But nobody that I work with is is into them, or or it would happen. I, I love the irony, the, the irony of, of this, uh, just, when it works, oh wait a minute, here we go. I, I, love, I love the irony of this, I just, I just think this is, this is great, I'm using this blue laser, this $35,000 electronic screwdriver to, you know, to, to, to point things. But, uh, but over time, I, I, did, I appreciated the fact that that, uh, that Ivan uh, made a business out of it, and it was something that I couldn't do. And they found a way to do it, I assume, economically. And, uh, and that was really my experience with it, and I would love to keep drawing it again. The one time I went to experiment, I was invited to a company, and they were in Santa Monica, I don't remember their name, but it was one of those big, powerful, air-cooled lasers. Uh, and anything I wanted to do, they said no. Not because they didn't want me to do it, but because anything I wanted to do involved blinding somebody. <laughs> there was nothing, none of my tricks, I, I spent two years doing my tricks, and every little trick, the filter and everything I had, they said it's beautiful in the studio, but you can't do that because, you know, it's, it, it's, it's too dangerous. And now, of course, lasers have become a trope. Every, Constantly, big concert has to have them. You really need to see them so they fill the place up with smoke, <laughs> and mist, um, and and they're they're kind of the misunderstood and, and under unappreciated um, by by people. And I think that that it's a wonderful form. I hope we, we don't lose it. So also, I just want to go back to uh, what Josh was said about coherence, um, and just pause for a minute so maybe you can explain what coherence means and what what makes laser light so unique. Yeah, you know, I was hoping that, that that would show as I changed the images. It does. If you look at the light, the, the green light, and you move your head back and forth, you'll see it kind of sparkle. If you wear glasses, you can take your glasses off, and the sparkles will get even bigger. Now, why is that? It's because the light is coherent, unlike ordinary light. What does it mean to be coherent light? The people that usually 
talk about that. Talk about, imagine going to um, Times Square on New Year's Eve. Lots of people milling around. It's just really a lot of, lot of motion going on. Then imagine, let's say, Nazi soldiers. <laughs> They're all right in step. Everybody's in step, and it's pretty scary. Well, it's exactly the analogy. Ordinary light is, is completely random. Laser light is designed such that every single photon that comes out is exactly in phase. Now, what that is going to do, it's going to hit him here, and then, <laughs> then it's going to reflect into your eyeball, or, or let's say it'll hit the screen, and then it's going to reflect into your eyeball. But the screen is not flat at the level of light. And so every little piece of that screen reflects at a slightly different point. And when it gets to your eyeballs, these Nazis are in the <laughs> top of the step, and these Nazis are in the bottom of the step, and those. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> we, we call that, oh, I guess you're not supposed to refer to Nazis, are you? <laughs> Genius like Wilfred was breaking it up. Well, that's um, oh, 
<laughs> That's an actually interesting segue because um, one thing I've always wondered about is the halogen light bulb. You know, a point source, bright, higher color temperature, cleaner color spectrum light bulb had been invented during Wilfred's lifetime when he was still working, and he, for whatever reason, never played around with it. He always stuck with just um, just incandescent tungsten lamps. He never played around with the halogen bulb. Um, and I also want to say, based on something you were talking about today, which is important, I think, um, that Wilfred spent his entire life um, really wanting to, to spread the word, to, you know, for Lumia to catch fire as an idea, and it never really did the way he wanted. He had a few disciples and acolytes that came and went over the years, and um, he, in correspondence, I think, with his friend John Conway, uh, said something to the effect of, you know, these kids and their psychedelic um, light shows, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's too aggressive, um, it's not contemplative, uh, and, and he didn't, he was dismissive of it. And the shame of that is Wilfred spent his entire life wanting to pass this on, and here's this group of people that are so lovingly paying tribute to him. And, um, and taking his ideas and doing something very different with it. And, and he never really got to appreciate it. And, and that just makes me really sad. Yeah, he, di he died when, the light, when our light show went to Carnegie Hall and performed um, a Symphony Fantastique on the back wall of a Carnegie Hall. Uh, and Stokowski was the conductor. And beautiful, beautiful. And, and it, was, uh, it was amazing because we were bouncing mirrors off the wall. It was just a high set. And you can see that we were, we were honoring his techniques. And we all knew it. We called it Lumia. We're a capital L in our, in our show. Well, let's leave it at the ground, but I do want to see if the audience has any questions. Um, so let's do that. Up there, right? Yes. Um, that was a screen about um, maybe two feet by two and a half feet, uh, or a foot and a half by about two feet. Um, I should remember, it's, it's, uh, it's actually in my apartment right now, that, that particular piece. Uh, so thank, thank heavens to, um, sorry, my pocket is um, uh, Thank heavens for 60 frames, 10 bit, um, you know, uh, video digital video. Uh, Wilfred did not want Lumia to be filmed in when he was alive. He experimented a little bit with uh, with NBC, I think in the 30s. He wanted it at first to be broadcast on television to every home. But but he very quickly started, you know, he realized that you know the, the, the dynamic range of film, the color rendition of color film at the time, um, and 24 frames a second did not um, it chops it up too much, it's too jerky. So 60 frames a second really is um, is the bare minimum to do it. I'm actually looking forward to the next revision of you know 4K cameras or 8K cameras that shoot at 120 because that's when the, every time a new generation of camera comes out, I try and get it. Um, if there's any camera geeks out there, um, I'm shooting I'm shooting 422, mostly DSLR. I'm not shooting a RED camera on Alexa. I'm not shooting 444 on compressed because with what cameras that I can afford, I can shoot hours and not have to rent, you know, the camera. And so I can capture, you know, I, I can have a digital archive of most of Wilfred's works. Um, I've met many of them and I've filmed many of them. If I had to rent a red or an Alexa or something like that, I just I just would not be able to do have as much of an archive as I've, I've built. Um, but back to your question, it's relatively small. It's basically television size. Um, and with the new cameras, we can blow it up nice and big. And, and actually, that was a heavily compressed. I had to put that on a thumb drive. You know, that was like a 60 gigabyte file that I crunched down to about five or six just so I could get it on a thumb drive and get it here in time for the show or for the tonight. So um, uncompressed, but relatively uncompressed. Um, it looks a lot better. Thank you. 
so just to just to repeat, the question is about the relationship of music to the films that we shot, saw specifically Josh Gillies and Jason. Yeah, I was just going to say that the Ivan Dreyer did it all, and actually, I don't know. Uh, I had left to go around the world when he finished up the film, and I was looking at it. I'm not sure that those were all my images. He may have started doing some of those images, but at least I can't remember how some of them were made, so I can't claim credit. Um, but uh, he was he was responsible for it all. And it's a, I consider it a really excellent uh, combination of the music and the, the lights. Of course, the one I like is the very quiet one that has the pattern moving around, uh, the very classical music. And, and frankly, the reason I left uh, the lasering was that they were going into the psychedelic, and I was a classical music freak. Thank you. I mean, I, for your compliment about it, that is that is the magic, of course, of synesthesia. Our stuff, uh, and and just to a great degree, uh, the Nigerian stuff is is really not synchronized with music. It's it's asynchronous, and you you do the work. You put it together in your head, and that's the magic of it. Yeah. You, if you, it, you you don't want to actually see something in dead in dead sync. It, it, it's very off putting much more interesting if your mind does it. Yeah. Um, so uh, Wilfred's idea of, of Lumia was that it was a silent art. He wasn't absolutely um, rigid about that. He did experiment most famously with Stokowski in um, the 1920s um, at Carnegie Hall. Uh, and, um, but the, uh, so he felt very strongly that Lumia should be silent and it should lead to an inward looking uh, experience for the viewer and uh, uh, the, I love it when I can show a piece in silence, you know, that was a seven minute piece and just sort of gauge how patient the audience is. And I think that this is especially obvious because you guys are expecting to be tuned in and, and, and appreciative of, of what it is, but imagine showing this to, you know, um, uh, an auditorium full of like, high school kids or college kids, it's like, you know, would they be patient? And I think Wilfred himself would occasionally play a record when he found an impatient audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Let, may I ask a question? Yeah. Which is our neighbor, who's very, very rich, has one of these huge televisions that, that is eight feet by 12 feet or something <laughs> uh, in, in a room. And most of the time, he just has on it uh, very high def, uh, just some image or other. Now it seems to me that you could run the Lumia constantly there and it could be the moving art. Um, did he think about that at all? Have you thought about it? Maybe you should sell those. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, up until a couple months ago, if you went to cloudwalks.org, you could actually buy our DVD. Um, but the uh, I stopped selling it because I it, I it was a DVD, so it wasn't even a Blu-ray. And you know, unfortunately, Lumia plays directly into the weaknesses in uh, MPEG compression, and um, and which is why like the Joshua Light Show looks so beautiful in 4K, and the Lumia looked great, but it you know it had a lot of artifacts just because it's. Um, uh, it, it's really challenging to the map to, to really capture it, and the sensors too. Um, but uh, I will say, and I've always wanted to meet the engineers at Apple that uh, created the, um, the Flurry screensaver, which is one of the small <coughs> screensavers in OS X, um, because it, that's Lumia. And you know, did they know what they were doing when they did that? Um, and there's a, 
kind of iconic photo of Lofrid with a model C clavelist from 1923 sitting on that stage, and it's a set from an opera, and they, I think they just brought him in on an off night, set him on the screen. Um, but yeah, to that, Wilfred's earliest work was as performance for audiences. And what you saw there was a Clavelex Junior, which was a home instrument. It was the second attempt at making something that you could sell to people for their home from 1930. Um, and, uh, but Wilfred being a musician himself, he actually was a world famous musician. He was a lute player that played um, uh, medieval uh, minstrel songs on the arch lute, which looked a lot like Jimmy Page's uh, double neck guitar, if you know what I'm talking about. And, um, and that's how he was able to get himself over to the States was as a famous lute player. And he played Broadway theaters, you know, as Wilfred the Lute Player. Uh, and some great films. <laughs> and the, the fact that he threw away his music career you know, to pursue this, but then continue to use a musical symphonic, um, sorry, I'm vibrating, that's probably someone who needs something from me back in Seattle, um, <laughs> that, that he continued to use a vocabulary that came from the music and symphonic world is always fascinating, you know, everything had movements and opus numbers and, you know, Lucata was one of his names and um, uh, a lot of his composition names had, uh, were inspired by you know, classical music. Does that answer your question? Well, except that also, I was going to tack on to that, do we understand much more about the mix of perception, sound, and perception, vision, than we did then? I, I think we're learning more about the neurology and how that works. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we do. I'm sure there's all sorts of psychiatric studies about that. Oh, actually, can I go off on a quick tangent? Okay. Um, Wilfred Hiltz, he always felt that, you know, as I talked about earlier, that uh, watching Lumia should be a contemplative um, exercise, and he built a device in um, a collaboration, I can't remember the name of the doctor, called the Phantoscope, and the idea was that this would be a moving light, similar to a Rorschach test that could be used for psychiatric and psychological evaluations. And what they quickly found out was the Rorschach test that you've seen is actually, we're all looking at the same 12 ink blots or the same 20 ink blots. It's very regimented across internationally. And Lumia is just this constantly thing. It's hard to nail down what it is and have a common frame of reference. But, um, but the idea of that it was something, um, the, the experience of the mind, the potential to grow the mind and grow that level, that area of exploration was very much in his thinking. We have time for maybe one more and then we'll leave the more questions in the back. We got it. <laughs> I got a question for Joshua. I got to ask. You were at the Fillmore during the classic years. What did Jerry think of the light show? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry who? <laughs> It was a lovely time because we were actually all together. It, there was none of the security and the just the sort of endless amounts of patois that was associated. Everybody was just backstage, and our our dressing room was next to their dressing room, and we talked all the time. And they loved us, and we loved them. But it was Jerry, the, Jerry Garcia. I, it was Jerry Garcia. But it was uh, it, it all that kind of became very regimented at the. In, in the 70s. The drugs changed, everything changed. But, yeah. he, but when I worked with him, he was this sweet guy. There were, there were different degrees of crazy but he, in, that, in that particular group, but he was very sweet. He was a sweet guy. Okay, please join me in thanking. Oh, I'm sorry, I know it's kind of about to have to wrap up. If anybody has like the old diet, they don't ask this question. But I think you guys are good. Um, so, um, but I will say that some of us are going to head over to Veronica's, which is a bar on 36th Street, just around the corner. So if anybody wants to come and continue the conversation, I encourage it. Um, but please join me in thanking Joshua White. And Joshua White. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.